you know, the completion of that thought is that uh, monoculture is not something that I like to um, put forth as a, as, a, as a solution. So I don't grow my tomatoes, it's only tomatoes here. Like, um, where my peppers and eggplants and watermelons and basil and okra are all growing together in the same root house. Um, you know, back and forth, interplanted. So I think companion planting and polycultures um, are a strategy that is, seems to be the one that nature uses. Nature seems to do polyculture. Nature doesn't seem to do tillage or bare soil. So let's see if we can integrate polyculture and not tillage and not bare soil into our farming practices. Um, so that's where I'm, I'm in that trajectory somewhere moving, moving forward. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> I do certainly have the areas where yeah, the beans are always over here and the cucumbers are there and the tomatoes are here. Um, and there's things going around them. They're actually not too far away from each other. There'll be salad greens in between them. Um, but this is a bed of salad greens. That's a bed of tomatoes. That's a bed of green beans. Um, yeah. Okay, that's a thought. Um, there was a point about cats and songbirds. I can't remember who. Was that your point? Yes. Um, so I was <laughs> proposing my strategy of, of uh, somewhat hungry felines as a way to deal with rodents. Um, and I'm not going to disagree with that. I mean, they certainly do eat birds. I think they eat a lot more rodents than they eat birds. Um, um, my only other solution is rat poison, which I have used in the past um, to kill rodents because there's just so many of them. So um, <clears throat> it's a very good point. I mean, I, I mean people may have been aware of the studies that say you know so many million songbirds are eaten by uh, domesticated cats every year, and songbird populations are in decline. Um, I think we can all and should all, as part of a larger strategy, do much more with our land as far as um, hedgerows and increasing habitat. I think um, we've got a lot of forest and generally a good amount of fields like hay fields and our garden areas, but we don't really have hedgerows. We don't really have those, um, you know, um, berries and nuts and I know in, traditionally in Great Britain at least, there was a lot of hedgerows. Anyone ever seen those pictures of hedgerows in Great Britain? Pictures, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful integrations of, you know, plums and berries and um, some nuts and you can do some amazing things in those areas. And I think uh, what we don't have is enough habitat. We don't have enough foods um, for all of those pollinators and birds and all those other things that give us breadth to the whole um, ecosystem. So um, I am sensitive to that point um, and, and I think something we can all do more of and it would be beneficial for our operations in general would be to do more with more with those hedgerows um, and the peripheries. So, um, okay, that's what I want to say about cats and birds. Um, um, efficiency and yield, and I discussed, I'll, I'll leave that on, on that for now. Um, rind and solarizing, um, that was your question? Mm -hmm. Cover crops? I haven't talked about cover crops yet, that's a really important piece of the puzzle. It's too late to plant cover crops now. But in general, something I strongly, strongly suggest is cover crops. Um, so let me just give you a quick overview on the topic uh, from my perspective. Uh, cover crops are basically your opportunity to do polycultures in an area where you're doing monoculture, for starters. So even if you are doing, here's my cucumbers, here's my tomatoes, here's the potatoes, for you know four or five months of the year, you have the opportunity to do for another four or five or even eight months of the year, do a polyculture. You can do rye with... Um, vetch with uh, clover, or you can do oats with field peas with forage radishes. You can do um, lots of multi-species uh, cover crops um, at the end of the season and the beginning of the season um, that will give you a lot of the benefits of polyculture, even in your annual cropping area. So um, my understanding is that the baseline is three different species. You must have three in different families. So like rye and, well actually, rye and vetch and clover. Vetch and clover are different families, but they're kind of close. Um, but you can say oats and field peas and um, forage radishes. And I say those, those three sets together because the first three are overwintering cover crops, and the second three are winter killing cover crops. So um, the issue was, what do you do with rye in the springtime? And you don't plant rye where you want to have spring crops. 
where you want to have spring crops like um, carrots and beets and spinach and onions and peas and broccoli, all those things that are going to go in in end of April or beginning of May, um, you put in the fall cover crops that will winter kill. So, you know, oats and um, field peas and forage radishes will all die in the winter and lay down and be a nice mulch layer where you shouldn't necessarily need to do any tillage to be able to plant their first thing in the spring or first couple weeks in the spring. Um, things like rye, um, has, which is a really, really good cover crop. Um, what you want to do with rye to minimize tillage or not use tillage is to wait um, and plant in the area where the rye is growing the warm weather crops. So um, tomatoes, peppers, you know, eggplants, squashes, melons. Um, I wouldn't even put potatoes in that section actually. But um, all your warm weather crops, all your crops that get killed by frost are the ones that I'd put into areas where you had your rye cover crop growing. And that is because rye will go to seed before that time comes to plant those things. It goes, there's this um, phase, people heard of the milk, milk stage, you may heard of the milk stage in, in rye. Uh, all your annual grains will do this. Um, after the flower is pollinated, after the head, right, the head forms, and then the <clears throat> first it's flowers, so they get pollinated, and they all form into seeds. Between the flower being pollinated and the seeds being viable, is like a 10 day window, and if you squish the, squish the head, you'll get like a milky white fluid coming out. Um, that's before the grain is viable. That's called the milk stage. And as soon as the, as the flower is pollinated, there's a hormonal shift that goes on in the plant. And it basically says, okay, I'm done growing. I'm now going to suck all my life force and put it into my babies. And they literally will not grow another leaf as soon as they get pollinated. And all they're going to do is take all the energy out of their roots, out of their leaves, and stick it into the seed head. So um, you don't need to till the rye to kill it at that stage. You can simply knock it over. You can simply kink the stem, bend the stem, or you can scythe it, or you can weed whack it, or you can mow it, um, and you can kill the rye without having to till the soil. Um, um, and I don't, there's a John, not John, a Fed, not, uh, Rodale has popularized something called a uh, roller crimper. Um, I don't think they actually designed it, but they popularized it for sure. There's lots of YouTubes you can see of it. But basically it's a big, a big like a barrel with a couple pieces of metal screwed onto it um, on the front of the tractor where the bucket would be and the corn planter in the back. And they literally go through this field of waving, you know, rye and they knock it over with the, with the roller in the front and they plant into it in the back. Just basically, you know, digging up little trench and putting the seed in. And after the tractor is passed, it looks like you see a field of knock down rye. And a week later, take a picture and you see rows of corn coming up in this beautifully mulched field of rye. Except it wasn't tilled and all that massive root system is still there dying back and feeding the soil life. And there's lots of soil life that can feed the, the corn that's just germinating. Um, so you can basically transition from a nice rye cover crop to a regular, you know, crop. You can transplant tomatoes into that, you can transplant eggplants, you can transplant squashes and melons and cucumbers into that. You can plant beans into it. All those warm weather crops can go into that environment where you've got the rye laying down directly without having to till the soil. Um, and I think that's a really potentially very valuable um, um, strategy. If you've got a little bit of clover in that environment, um, I have no problem with a little bit of clover growing in and around my tomatoes and eggplants and summer squash. Personally, I wouldn't consider that to be a weed. I consider that to be a you know, polyculture symbiote. So some people don't want to see anything growing around their crops. They want to see bare soil and straight lines of the crops they want. And that's their idea of farming. Um, I would say, uh, we are all traumatized by our cultural um, <laughs> upbringing, and that concept is one of those traumas, right, that we think that's pretty. Straight lines, bare soil, I don't think is pretty. I think that's, you know, that's anathema to nature. And if we can envision, you know, the clovers and the mulches and all that kind of stuff growing and we're just putting things in, um, you know, at the right moment, doing a little, a really light touch, minimal effort, you know, strategically, you can, that's when you get the leverage of limited effort, limited resources, significant output.
Yeah. How long would you wait after the right is cut before you can plant the next plant because of the allopathic quality of the allopathic aspect of rye occurs when it's young. It does not occur when it's old and it's reaching maturity. It, the, so rye has this effect of it will inject into the soil compounds that make it difficult for other plants to germinate and grow. My understanding is that is not present at the end of the life cycle. It's present at the, at the beginning of the life cycle. Um, like I said, Rodale has this you know video online where they're literally knocking the rye down at the front of the tractor and planting the corn seeds behind the tractor in one pass. It's one pass, that's it. Um, and uh, I think they've you know, documented formally with the proper science significant system benefits from doing that. So, um, yeah, there's the concept. So to crimp it, it has to be the milk. Most so if you want it to die without the seeds becoming viable, it has to happen in the milk stage. If you are okay with having rye be a crop that you can feed your chickens with, in the winter time, then you just wait a couple extra days, and you can scythe it or um, you know harvest it as a, as a crop, mm -hmm. um, and, and then and then and then plant it in the stubble. There's no reason you couldn't you couldn't do that and plant it in the stubble. Yeah. How long does it take for rye to uh, grow to that stage? Uh, it just, it seems to happen around the middle of May. That's been my experience. And around the middle of May is when it goes to seed which is generally right before I want to be putting in all my warm weather crops. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's, how much it's, it's dependent on time. If you plant it in April, it wouldn't happen in May. But I'm just right. if you plant it in the fall. fall. Right. right. Um, yeah, seems to be around that window. Um, okay, so that was cover crops. Right. Solarizing was, was your question. Some people will, um, you know, kill weeds and prepare seed beds with, um, without using a rototiller by taking a big piece of tarp or greenhouse plastic and laying it on the bed for a while. Um, I haven't done that myself. I know farmers that do. Um, I'm, and the question was, you know, am I concerned about that or what would I have any concerns? Um, I have stuck my hand underneath greenhouse plastic on a sunny day and, you know, if you put a piece of greenhouse plastic on the lawn, on this, you know, <laughs> in July for an hour, and it, the yeah. grass is dead. <laughs> Basically, due to the fact that it's 120 degrees under there. So, I'd be a little bit concerned about the temperature and having a negative effect on the soil life. But I'd much rather have something covered in the soil than have the soil be bare. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't have any much experience, so I can't really speak to it. <clears throat> um, all right. Um, all right, enough questions for now? Get back to the agenda. <clears throat> it's getting quieter and quieter as the day proceeds. Hmm. <laughs> 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 I didn't even get a rise. It's <laughs> a lot to digest. Is that what it is? Is that all, for that me all it is? <laughs> for me. I feel like I'm losing people. Um, I like more interaction. Um, all right, so we are on the top of page four with the handout. Um, we just got down with uh, the mineral section, and I like to uh, take at least five or ten minutes during the course to give people a quick, um, you know, a primer on the organization and what we're up to and, uh, and things. So this is what I've got written into the agenda. Um, the BFA, Biology Food Association, we are a four-year-old uh, educational nonprofit. Uh, based out of my barn, um, upstairs in the barn, we built a little office. <laughs> um, that's headquarters. Um, we have been at this point traveling across the country, giving these courses, these two-day courses, um, very much like this. It's usually a mix of homesteaders and farmers and backyard gardeners. Um, um, you know, from rural West Virginia to um, uh, you know. Ohio and Michigan and Illinois and Iowa and Colorado and California, not to mention, you know, Ontario and the Maritimes and up and down the East Coast. So it's, it's, it's spreading um, fairly well. Um, it's very much a grassroots word of mouth operation. You know, somebody says, this is really good stuff, and they tell some people in the local area, and they find a, you know, a church basement or a grange hall or something, and we, and we do these courses. And so, um, with that as an impetus, we've been building um, what feels like a nice grassroots uh, organization. Uh, we've got local chapters established now 
um, in many of those states I just recounted, uh, local chapters being, you know, basically people who take the course and are conversant with the concepts, wanting to take it forward, wanting to, you know, practice together, study together, stay in touch, um, coordinate um, access to minerals, um, maybe um, talk about, you know, reaching out to local organizations, networks, uh, marketing together, things like that. So. Um, that is uh, one piece of what we're doing, is the education work and the, and the local chapter <coughs> development. We do now have the depots in, uh, system in place, so we have the minerals available, you know, at, basically at cost, so we can drop people's um, input costs dramatically. Um, we are, research has been one of our, our um, visions and objectives, and we're getting more and more um, well established in that. Um, we had a research committee meeting with, I think, was it 12 different PhDs from 10 different fields this summer in, um, in New York State? Uh, geneticists and agronomists and nutritionists and physicists and all kinds of people um, in actually some pretty powerful positions, you know, in um, Extension and the USDA and you know, professors and all that kind of stuff. Um, really, I was, I've kind of written off historically the academic community um, as being too linear and single factor in their analysis to understand these more, you know, multifaceted th um, things. But I was really very impressed with the level of openness and um, desire to collaborate um, that we found in the research community. So we've got a, a PhD lady now um, who's very sweet um, and very competent um, directing the research project. Um, we have a, a fairly ambitious objective, which is to prove the veracity of all these things in their relationship to each other, um, and specifically um, the increase in nutrient values in crops, and develop you know real data sets on the spectrum of variation of nutrient values in crops. Because the idea is that um, <clears throat> while a lot of growers get this stuff um, sort of you know like oh this works and oh my god I can actually make a living farming. Um, there's not a lot of farmers in this country, but there's a lot of people who buy food in this country. And so if we want to reach a broader audience and integrate the, the whole uh, economic aspect, we need to be able to speak to consumers as well and to be able to formally um, verify this farmer is producing superior quality crops. Um, you know, here's where they are. Um, that would basically be a strong economic support to anybody who's doing this kind of management. So. Um, the long-term vision is to have a tool that a consumer can use to go to the grocery store, go to the farmer's market, choose which CSA to join, which is a you know, flash of light, like a little pointer, you know those things they've got with PowerPoints, a little laser <laughs> pointer, right? You can go on the carrot and go, crap, crap, decent, and literally choose which bag of carrots um, to, at the grocery store has most nutrition, most flavor for your children. Um, um, the idea would be that that would be a, a game changer um, as far as economic leverage is concerned for anybody who's got a political analysis or economic analysis, um, even somewhat cynical. Um, you, you know, for me, <laughs> money talks. Um, you know, idealism is great and inspiration is great, and um, when push comes to shove, money pays the bills. And if we can't drive money towards superior quality, then you know we're we're going to be talking to a very small niche audience, and so um, you know having a tool that can empirically verify the superiority of this crop over that one um, is the idea is that that would have a significant economic driver effect. I'll just give you a quick example. So, so okay. she is going ahead and trying to make one of those little zapper things. Uh, right now we're we're putting together the research project where we we for, the tools exist. Oh, I see. They haven't been calibrated. Oh to this purpose because no one has the data for the spectrum of variation in crops. What is quality? What's a high quality carrot? If you were to like ask for what's this what's the carotenoid levels and the copper zinc ratios in a high quality carrot versus a low quality carrot, nobody can tell you. The data does not exist. You know, it's not there the the nutrient profile of superior quality versus inferior quality. Um, if it has been done, it's been done by a company that is keeping the information proprietary. It's not in the mm -hmm. literature. Um, so the first thing we have to do is to actually 
actually build a data set which shows the spectrum of variation. And then once we've got that, then it's, it's a fairly small job to um, develop the algor algorithms and calibrate the tool. So um, anyway, so this is all very exciting. For that. What's that? There must be a huge market for that. I mean, every whatever I go talk to whatever I go talk to consumers, like yeah. in a church basement somewhere, just people, Amazing. not you know, <laughs> not hippy dippy up in Vermont people, but like you know, just sort of working class, you know, Worcester County people say, right? Like just regular working class normal people, um, mothers and grandmothers, I find get really really excited. Um, and I'm not I'm trying to be not to be a sexist here, but um, I, <laughs> they get really, really excited. Like I want that. <laughs> like I'll pay for it. <laughs> and you know, I mean, realistically, it looks like the price point could be less than a smartphone. You know, 150 bucks, 200 bucks, something like that. Um, and version 2.0 or 3.0 could be a downloadable app because your smartphone camera could take the picture in that frequency range to see the spectrum. You know, to see the, the vibrations of the nutrients, basically. Cool. So, um, so this is all pioneering stuff you're doing. It's like you we're know, trying to organize a movement yeah. and the revolution um, in a very non-confrontational um, manner. Well, you're going to you're going to have confrontation. That's an So far, so good. I mean, we're not fighting anybody. I bet it'll come to a point where somebody's going to be like, "Well, conventional paradigms will conflict with what you're doing, what you're suggesting." They already do conflict. So that's what I'm saying. You're going to have confrontation. You should get comfortable with that. Idea. Um, I, I think your attitude has a lot to do with um, what comes at you. I don't know. I mean, sure. At some point, perhaps. Um, I spent a lot of time. I think I mentioned this earlier. Being a you know 9/11 truth activist and a mm -hmm. political, you know, you know, organizer and a GMO activist, and I have experienced lots of confrontation. And I've been talking about this stuff, this kind of stuff, now for a few years, and. I've been experiencing only massive receptivity. I'm sure there's resistance somewhere, but it's not anywhere close to the field right well, now. I'm saying on a corporate level, on an industrial yeah. level, you're going to have that because you're introducing a whole new paradigm. Just like there I'm was, just, a new paradigm. just like this there was, all, like this don't smoke cigarettes. That's bad, and people suppressed that for 50 years. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, okay. we'll see. It, it, Whatever it will be, will be. <laughs> I think you know the best thing we can do is 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 devise a strategy that's proactive, that's working to create the reality we want to see, as opposed to fighting the reality we don't want to see. Um, I think this is a totally new paradigm, and even though it may be smack in front of someone's face, if they're operating out of a different set of understandings, they can't see it. Um, maybe I, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. Um, there's still a role for Monsanto, right? To distribute rock dust and inoculants, um, they have they have a massive supply chain that they could be you know totally valuable in helping to revitalize Central Asia. Except their whole history has been never to be that way. It's never to be cooperative. It's to be a monopoly. So that's a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shift. I'm not so concerned about the enemies. I'm more concerned about the allies. And Absolutely. I think there's tons of good people out there I who agree. are very receptive to what we're doing. And um, my objective is to be in communication and collaboration with those people. I agree. And let the rest of it um, to sing. play, <laughs> as it will. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. I've always told my wife I would love to, you know, a little jail time. Wow. <laughs> I'm not saying it's going to come to A couple, couple, years, couple just, of years of quietude would be... <laughs> just say, can't give me a back to my meditation. Yeah. I would be really appreciative of that. But, um, yeah, who knows how it all transpires. Anyway, I don't want to digress too far. Um, but uh, the best tool we have now is this tool called a refractometer, which actually does do a pretty good job of telling you relatively how good this carrot is versus that carrot. The only problem is you have to take a piece of the carrot and squish it to get the juice out of it to get the reading. And that's a pain in the butt in the grocery store. And they don't really like it. We take chunks out of the wrappers. <laughs> um, no, 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 leave that one. Um, so logistically, this is not pragmatic for the supply chain. But I talked to Whole Foods about this a couple of years ago. Um, the regional buyer for the North Atlantic region, um, operating out of you know Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, about the idea, the tool, and the strategy. And he said, "Well, um, we certainly are not going to support this, um, but." when you get a couple of years from having it available, please come tell us, because we'll tell our growers that they have two years to meet standard, because we don't want to get caught with our pants down. Um, 
So the way I see it is sort of enlightened self-interest. Um, that when we know that we can tell quality, then people are going to have a very, very strong incentive to get their acts in gear and change their management practices. Looks good on paper. What's that? Looks good on paper. What, what looks good on paper? What you just said. That yeah. would be great. But people aren't always, the corporations aren't always that way. Well, this is why it's important to be talking to people. That's why I this, you, this, is why, this is why the organization is working right. as, in a grassroots manner. Right. And not just working with growers, but working with consumers and nutritionists right. and raising understanding about these issues and the correlation between healthy crops and health. Exactly. Um, and there's a lot of people who want to heal themselves, who care about their children, right. whose children are getting sick. For me, you know, I think, I mean, it, it, I'm kind of excited by the level of degenerative disease in the country. I think it's getting to an academic status and just about everybody knows somebody in their family who's got something serious going on. And the data is pretty categorical about the correlation between nutrition and health. And even down in the very much of the you know, rudiments of the mainstream, people are waking up about the connection between food quality and the health of their children. So I think there's a massive pent up desire for this. And when we do begin to put the dots together formally with good science, um, I don't think that it's going to be easy to stop. Um, so anyway, who knows? Um, that's one piece of what we're doing is the research. Um, another piece of what we're doing is we have an annual conference we call the Soil and Nutrition Conference. This year it's in the, well it's usually in the second weekend of February. So this year it's the 8th and 9th of February. Uh, anybody who wants to meet a bunch of like-minded people from around the region um, and some from around the country, um, it's at the Kripalins Institute, which is in uh, Berkshire's, uh, 8th and 9th of February. Um, and we are actively bringing in nutritionists this year. Um, it has been primarily historically just about agronomy and best practices for growing, but we're actually integrating nutritionists and bringing a bunch of PhDs, you know, agronomy researchers in to talk about. And we're really trying to bring together the scientists and the farmers and the nutritionists um, and anybody else who wants to come in. But, but let's try to build a nexus point where those people of like mind from these different fields can can connect and, and build relationships and, and start to work together. So um, there are other things we're doing, um, but that's enough for now. I'm sure more pieces will come up. Oh, anybody who's a member um, gets a, we have a consultant now, a staff consultant. So uh, we will walk you through your fertility plan, your management practices. Wow. Um, it's our objective to help you succeed. If this is true, it'll work. If it works, it'll spread. So if we can help you succeed and give you the support you need, to, the class is great, hopefully, you know, inspiring, but then you leave with your head, you know, buzzing and you, like follow through is not very much. How much does it cost to be a member? Uh, basic membership is 50 bucks. If you want the refractometer and the press, this bad boy and this bad boy and the chart, so you can test crop quality, um, that's 150, um, um, and uh, if you're a farmer for 250, you get a profile page on the website where people can find you, um, and you get discounts for you know one-ton totes of minerals and all that kind of stuff. Everything goes up to a deeper improvement. So um, we're basically trying to build a, a you know a community of of like minds um, around these things and to build it actually on the ground with people doing the work, building the soil, eat, producing the food, eating the food, um, doing the science um, around these questions of quality, nutrition, and, and, and biological systems. So, here, here. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's kind of exciting. It is. Um, it is. <laughs> this is the membership form where you can go online. Um, there, that's my pitch. Yes? Uh, the, I'm sorry, the first instrument, is that the same thing as a BRICS reading? Or? The refectometer gives you a BRICS reading. Okay, so that is the sugar content. It's not sugar. Oh, okay. What is, what is we will talk about bricks tomorrow. Okay. It's on the agenda. Yes. <laughs> it's not just sugar. It's much more than just sugar. It's simplified. People say it's just telling you sugar level. It's 